Wow. 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 What a beautiful crowd. Yeah. It is so lovely to see y'all here tonight and for us to be back in Oakland. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, many of you, for encouraging us to reorganize our own event for Oakland when the first event fell through at the original venue. We got many texts and calls encouraging us to still come to Oakland. So thank you for that encouragement. Thank you for coming tonight. Welcome, y'all. Hmm. A lovely, lovely welcome. My name is Kasha Ho. I am um, the other co-founder alongside Prentice Hemphill of the Embodiment Institute. Uh, we are hosting this event since <laughs> we reorganized. <laughs> So I have the honor of doing what the venue normally does, which is welcoming you all and introducing these lovely humans. Um, thank you to Oak Stop for being our venue for tonight and setting up such a lovely um, atmosphere for us. There are bathrooms in that corner, so you can either go out that door around here if anyone needs bathrooms at any point. Um, and there were, I want to just do a couple logistical things if I introduce these folks. Um, there were index cards for questions as you walked in, but if you didn't grab one and want to, I think our team is going to be walking around with them. So we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. If you want to put any questions on these cards, um, I'll be handing them over to Malkia for Q&A during the discussion. Um, huge shout out and thank you to our Embodiment Institute team for pulling this event together real last minute. And so well. Thank you, Ms. Mayor Curtis, the official student leader. Devin Delina, who's hard at work taking pictures. Oscar Trujillo in the back. And Jennifer Yanello is here. Um, Debastri, who just ran back to her hotel room to get extra masks, if anyone needs masks. <laughs> um, there are a few back there now on the back table. Um, so thank you all for coming. I think those are all the logistical things I needed to say. Um, I'm going to introduce Malkia and Prentice in a moment. They'll have what I think is going to be a really beautiful conversation on stage here. Um, starting out with Malkia's questions, then some of yours, and Prentice will be doing a book signing at the end of the event at that lady table in the back. So um, if you have a book and want to have it personalized, um, they have all, all already been signed, so if y'all need to leave at the end of the event, um, they have, if you got them here, they've already been signed. Um, so yeah, here we are. Here we are. Um, Malkia Devich Siru. Sounds like y'all are already familiar with. <laughs> As you know, Malkia is an activist, a writer, a public speaker, and has been really a profound voice. Um, in the realm of media justice. They're the founding and former executive director of media justice and now a senior fellow there. <laughs> and Malachi has been a dear friend to us. And um, I just want to say that the way that you have allowed love to transform your life and transform our lives in the process and our community. And it sounds like this community, um, I hope you can see a reflection of the way that your love ripples out. Thank you. Yeah. And Prentice Hemphill. What? <laughs> Thank you. Francis Hemphill, author of What It Takes to Heal. <laughs> Founder of the Embodiment Institute and the Black Embodiment Initiative. Host of the new podcast, Becoming the People, formerly 
Forgot. Why didn't I just forget? <laughs> <laughs> We're really finding our way. Um, and someone whose love has transformed my life. And the lives of many others. Thank you all for being here. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. I'll turn it over to you. I need this. Okay, hi. I'm not st starting. You're starting. Oh, what am I starting with? Oh, I'm going to read. This is all news to me, so let me um, adjust. Um, but it's very exciting to be back here. So many familiar faces in this audience and teachers in this audience. And um, I'm shaped by this room. And um, I feel a lot of gratitude to you each for that. Um, so thank you. And let me find this page. It may take me a second because I didn't think I was reading. OK. 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 So if you haven't read the book yet, um, this is going to be a little maybe intense, so I'll just tell you that. It's, <laughs> it's not. Yeah, okay. Um, it's hard to heal when you're still being hurt. There was something disingenuous about trying to fit each client's emotion neatly into personal therapeutic rooms, and what they were feeling was never only individual. We needed, I thought, to be willing to step outside of these rooms and into the world, in a way that involved and maybe implicated all of us. After the verdict, Los Angeles shut down. The whole city erupted in protests and I went straight from the clinic to the streets, anxious to be with people who were willing to call out injustice and name what needed to change. I had planned to meet up with friends who were already marching, but I was late after seeing clients, so I parked my car just off Crenshaw Boulevard and started walking between the bodies of people. It was a warm night with an edge in the air music and sirens blending into a chaotic mix. But more than anything, there was a kind of beauty in this spontaneous gathering of people who were here because a boy had been taken from us. People with signs stood on corners and shouted, no justice, no peace, getting hoarse from the repetition. There were people clustered in parking lots, edging into the road, generations of families walking together. Occasionally, a wandering group of young people entered the intersection and stopped traffic or jumped on the hood of a cop car, and then a line of police with riot gear pushed the crowd back to its banks. But we weren't afraid. That night, the streets belonged to the people. It was my first protest after moving to Los Angeles, but it's a city that reminds you that it is built on the fault lines of past eruptions. Watts, the uprisings and riots in response to the beating of Rodney King, and the murder of young Latasha Harland, all of it was there in the air that night. It was electric, one of those rare moments when you can feel the raw power that exists when people come together. It felt like everything could be changed right then and there, and the presence of armored police vehicles somehow only confirmed this feeling. I walked through the streets in my work shoes and a tucked in Oxford shirt, my therapist's uniform. I opened the top buttons to breathe a bit easier. After a day of bumping up against the limitations of therapy, I needed this, this reminder that we could and should be able to shape what happens to our lives and communities. We were restoring a sense of our power that is lost in violation. It was its own kind of healing. I've been drawn to organizing at the tail end of my time in undergrad, searching for belonging and meaning and a way out of the feeling of futility. It had given me that, the sense that we could do something to change things. As much as I wanted individual therapy for every one of my clients, I wanted them to have this feeling too. I'll stop there. Can y'all hear me? Hello? Oh, I do. Oh, yeah. What about now? <laughs> <laughs> you wrote a book, right? Yeah. <laughs> That was wild. Fuck. Yo, can I say something real fast though? Come on, say it. Matt used to be my boss. Ah, yeah. okay. 
I was really not meant to manage nobody. They got you. <laughs> At a really important time, too. Because that's actually through you is how I, I encountered somatics in the first place. Right. I worked here. Mac was my boss back in the day. Y'all say y'all That's crazy. Me. That's crazy. Not Fred, this is my boss. <laughs> that's definitely not true. <laughs> okay, so you wrote a book. Did. You, you wrote a book. And before we even get into it, Right? Um, the book is called, right? What is it? What it takes to heal. Yeah? What it takes to heal. So just raise your hand if you've been asking yourself that question for the next, last 20, 30, 40, 40 50 40. years. <laughs> okay, okay. I know I'm not alone in here. I know I'm not alone. So everybody want to know. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm just posing a question. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, this is a question. Some ideas. This, yes. right? <laughs> no, but seriously, bro, on behalf of all of the survivors, on behalf of all of the activists, on behalf of everybody who's trying to answer that question, thank you. Thank you. Can we can we get better? Thank you. Thank you. That's kind of where I want to start, though. I want to start a, a, with a question about who the book is for. You know, because I, I read the book. I read the book today. I heard that. It's amazing. How did you? It's How amazing. Did you do that? Because you know, I'm amazing. I'm just playing. <laughs> I thought, you know, it was easy to read because it was fascinating. It was compelling. It was beautiful. It was beautifully written. Um, I didn't even know you wrote like that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I know the way you talk, but I didn't know you get down like that, you know? So I wanted to start by asking you about the people who the book is for. In the book you talked about, you named transitional characters. You talked about um, them as a key audience, and I felt like you was talking to me. You know what I mean? So I'm curious. I want to know more about this, this idea of transitional characters. Um, I want to know more about why you wrote the book for them, for us. Yeah. I love that um, question. And one thing I want to say that, uh, you know, if you got the book now, you're going to have like a limited print because in the next one, I changed the term because it's actually the wrong term. I said, uh, oh. It's transformational characters. Oh, I like that better. Oh, good. I'm glad because that's what the term is now. Um, but we borrowed the term from family systems therapy and this idea of a person in a family who is basically doing their work so they don't keep replicating patterns of harm and abuse or addiction, whatever it might be, so it doesn't carry into the next generation. And family systems therapy or this um, uh, one term is about that action that we might take in our family that interrupts the transmission of trauma in our, in our families. And when we were thinking about it at the Embodiment Institute, we were just like, oh, there's something to that because a family is a system in a way. And uh, this is a, a name for somebody that's like, oh, I'm going to change this system. And I, I was like, oh, that's what we're doing in all these different places. It's like systems change and that. It, it's meaningful in family systems to sort of identify this person. And so we started using this term transitional characters, but then transformational characters to talk about people who were taking on the work of changing systems that they were embedded in and taking on that kind of responsibility. And um, yeah, and, and I think the work of that is, you know, I start with the Grace Lee Boggs quote, but the work of that is transforming ourselves as we are transforming um, the world and conditions and systems. And I thought it was really important to start there, um, in part because it felt like, and it increasingly feels this way, that there are more and more people that are activated and don't exactly know where to begin or where to go. Um, and I wanted to offer a way of identifying ourselves or talking about what it is that we're up to for people that are feeling particularly activated in this moment to say we are transformational characters. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we got it. Well, a certain, in fact, does not mean that we have it all figured out, but that we're willing to try. We're willing to try to both um, 
deeply engage ourselves in transformation, and we're also willing to try and, and transforming alongside others, organizations, institutions, systems, society. Um, so I thought it was useful to have people who are feeling it have a way of identifying themselves. And I was talking to you. I was talking to really everybody in this room, but everybody, in a way, it's like, I'm talking to everybody who's willing to ask those questions, um, who's willing to engage. And it's a, it's both a low and a high bar. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of talking to everybody. I, when I was telling people about how I wrote it, why I wrote it the way I did, it's because I'm trying to talk to your mama and your cousin and you and, and that's important to me um, because I think there are people that are ready to act and ready to change and just need to be kind of organized into that. So that's why. Yeah, I, I love it in particular because I feel like there's a way that the term activist, right, doesn't necessarily hold everybody. You know what I mean? But when you start thinking about yourself in, in relationship to your family, you know what I'm saying? And what you're trying to change there and then make that connection between the self and the structure. You know what I'm saying? It just it just it just makes more sense. Right. It gives you a way a path to analysis. You feel me? That's not preachy and, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, okay. So you wrote in the book uh, that, to, you know, because I read the book, so I got quotes, yeah. <laughs> I got receipts. <laughs> you wrote that to envision futures is to conjure something that sits outside of your time and circumstance while being firmly rooted in the moment. Okay? You also said visions are rooted in longing. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now, you like a little poet up in this moment. <laughs> okay. So my question to you is like, what do you see as the relationship, right, between vision, longing, and commitment? And what do you, what is the power and the potential of longing for us, for change makers? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't ask no simple questions. Come on now. You certainly don't. And I'm just trying to like... <laughs> Come on, say me. <laughs> um, longing to me, I mean, longing, a lot of this I've, I've been taught through my somatics work, so I just want to name that. And there's people here that I've practiced with and studied with and learned from. My teachers are in this room, and so a lot of what I'm sharing with you comes from that practice. And what I've come to understand of it over time, when I think about, when I feel into longing, I think what's so powerful there that we might miss at times is that longing to me is so visceral. It's so emergent from our bodies in a way. And because of that, it recruits more of us into the vision that it creates. Like the part of us that is recruited, activated, is cellular, visceral, you know, it's our bodies, it's our being. We need to be met. Our longing needs to be met. Yeah. And it, and it, we can feel it, um, which I think is just really powerful when we imagine the other kinds of motivations we might have. Motivations that are like guilt or coercion or force or all these things that might cause us to act but what kind of action does it inspire and over what term, over what length of time or what amount of courage might it inspire, for example. So to me, longing is um, because of how visceral and embodied it is, what it creates in us is so much more powerful. And so if we can move from that place and actually create spaces for people to be in touch with their longing. I think that sustains people over the long term. I think it creates powerful leaders and powerful connections um, and powerful visions. So I think vision is that way of articulating or almost externalizing what the longing is. And I, I write in the book that I think, you know, I write about how when I was Oh, it's so funny, too, because today I was walking past Crossroads in Berkeley, you know, and they had a Dooney and Burke purse in the window. And when I was in the sixth grade, everybody 
with money had a Dunienberg purse, which was really like a middle-aged kind of purse, I think. <laughs> now that I look at it, I'm like, why would an 11 year old skip that purse? Um, but I wanted it, you know what I mean? I was like, I was like, mom, if I had that, I didn't even have anything to put in a purse. I had like a piece of chapstick to put in there. But I was like, if I had that purse, then, you know, so it's like that kind of craving I had, wanting. But if I look back on that time, underneath it was a longing to be accepted, to belong, to be among. It wasn't really about a purse. I had a deeper longing of acceptance. So I think our, our, our longings are much deeper and we end up visioning things that I, I think are actually much more transformative for the world and for our relationships. Um, when they come from that place, it's less easily commodified. It's less easily packaged. Um, that's why we get busy with wants. You know, they keep us busy with wants. I want this, I want this, I want this. I'm never in touch with the longing that might actually be satisfiable through our actions with each other. And what's interesting to me about that is the I feel like the right knows that, you know? Yeah. The right likes to speak to your deep belonging, yeah. you know? Yeah, and, that's right. And for some of us, you know, as as the left moves, sometimes we want to talk to the head, not the heart, that's you know? Right. That's we right. want to convince people facts and figures and yeah. da, da 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 right? But it's time for us to speak to the heart. Am I right? Yeah, we need to talk to the heart. And I feel like you really do that. Okay. So let's let's talk a little bit about this question of he said what it takes to heal. So I want to know about some healing. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get the answer. Okay. So um, you talk about healing. You say it's uh, through an orientation toward healing and repair for ourselves and others that we recover our capacity for feeling, for relationship, and with that the ability to strengthen our bonds and work together. Right. Did I actually say it? You wrote that shit. <laughs> you wrote that. I read it. You see? I got the right here. You wrote that. And and I thought that was particularly moving to me because, you know, I believe in movements, you know, um, and I believe in collective process and healing. Um, and movements are one of the ways that we forge kind of like collective identities of resistance, right, and vision. But these days, and in general, movements struggle to engage that healing process in our methods, uh-huh. right? A lot of times, I don't know about you, but my folks be like, that's some soft shit. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you know, do that. You know what I mean? You're supposed to leave your pain at the door yeah. so that you can get the work done, mm-hmm. Right. And so I want to I want to ask about what's the value, you know, of feeling and healing for justice movements. Like, why inside of movements do we need to take this step? Yeah. Um, that's what I thought for a long time too. I talked about it in the book. I was like, I don't want to be soft, and then here I am. <laughs> so I'm so soft. <laughs> it's all fit you, bro. I used to think I'm, I'm not soft. I'm soft. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you pointed out some of what I said about healing, too, because I do want to say that the way I'm holding the word is not a destination. It's not a place that we arrive at. I know a lot of y'all feel that. Um, But to me, it is an orientation to our lives. And it's an ongoing process and engagement with ourselves and our lives. So I just want to clarify that when I say what it takes to heal. It's kind of like, you know. It takes being on path (laughs) all the time and doing the work and we don't arrive there. Um, The question of feeling in particular, I think this is a place that you and I have had some conversation too because I I, I think it's so important to name that I think part of how things continue the way they do is that they really organize our feelings in a way. Um, in many ways denying us our emotions, our feelings, um, and orchestrating who can feel what, when, where, and how through social norms, through criminalizing, and these are trends that we've seen over time, and that it really relies on a lot can be done when we deny feeling. 
there's a lot that our bodies can go through when we are indoctrinated into an idea that we must deny our own feeling and bodies and lives in that way. There's a lot of exploitation that is possible. There is a lot of violence, um, mass violence, genocides that are possible when we deny feeling. Um, there's all kinds of theft that's possible when we deny feeling, when we do it and then criminalize feeling. There has to be that. And I say feeling because I, I think there really is a containment of all kinds of feeling. I think um, even our awe and wonder and curiosity gets contained inside of these systems too. So um, for me, feeling, you know, I don't, I think feeling is critical for us to um, actually relate to each other. I mean, we can think about it in that way. Like, how are we gonna be able to, when we talk about longing, if I don't actually feel what it is that I long for or that I'm committed to, I'm not actually gonna be trustworthy over the long term. <laughs> At some point, something else that is motivating me is gonna turn me around. And so if I'm more in touch with my feeling, there's something, it produces a kind of trustworthiness. I'm gonna put myself in positions that express the thing that I care for and care about. Um, so it strengthens our commitment, it strengthens our relationships. A lot of us are having relationships with each other that are not rooted in our actual feeling, but rooted in what we think we should feel or do or say or think. And so um, the authenticity that's available to us when we feel and allow feeling and I think it, it um, makes other things less possible when we feel our own lives and when we feel for each other. And that is what I hope continues to be true, that things become less possible when we allow feeling. And one of the things you said in the book, you talked about like if the a trope of the dumb American, you know, could be uh, somehow understood more as the, the numb American. Yeah. yeah? You really read this book. I read that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that, that was powerful to me, you know? Because that, you know, this denial of empathy, this erosion yeah. of empathy, yeah. this, this way that, um, you know, where we are right now, the moment we're in, is it feels so intended to uh, isolate us, you know, to erode our empathy and to terrify us into full submission. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And this, you know, as we as we work to build power and we build infrastructure and we organize communities, one of the things we're trying to do inside of that is 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 also remind people through our activity that they have the right yeah. to feel. Yeah. Right? And that we build the power to feel. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Not just to eat. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Not just to get our education, not just to get our housing, but to actually have the right to our feelings. To our yeah. own feelings. To our own, to feelings. Our own lives, to our yes. own bodies. That's and right. That, that, um, that piece around agency, too. Yeah. I yeah. mean, part of what I'm... Yeah, you said something about the C to A. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I don't remember what I said, but... <laughs> I got it right here. That's right. But that's, that's what I mean. I mean, partly... You know, there's a part of me that's like our interiors to me, my, my interior life produces a sense of wonder and awe for the whole world that I think is, you know, ungovernable. Un you can't capture the kind of awe that I feel for living. Um, and there's an activation here that I'm sort of asking for all of us. It's not that we're not going to be like, oh, I'm healed inside of these conditions that we're living inside of. Conditions are going to have to change. And yet there is an element of agency, an activation of our own agency that is so necessary for us to build relationship, to live inside of ourselves, from ourselves, to be able to perceive choice, to even be able to perceive choice and make whatever choices, however limited, whatever they, you know, um, but to feel agency, which I think a lot of us are, you know, tricked out of in so many ways or scared out of in so many ways, too. I mean, that's what you said. You said feeling is the seat of agency. Yeah. Right? If I can feel. That's what Audre Lorde said. Right. I feel, therefore I can be free. That's right. That's right. Um, and I just thought that was not only very true, but also beautiful. 
a beautiful way of saying that. Not a problem, though. You, you wrote a book about healing, and to, to do that, you also wrote a book about trauma, right? That's part of part of what's in there. There's a chapter on it. Yeah, there's a chapter on it. Um, and, you know, what we're experiencing right now, you know, is traumatic. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that trauma can short-circuit our longing, right? Keep a short-sighted tied to the past and focused on tracking and assessing danger. Anybody out here know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes. Not only do we feel that as individuals, but in our organized space and our movements, our strategies can be like that too. Yeah. And uh, given the conditions that we're in, rising fascist movements, authoritarian governments, economic instability, inequality, war, whatever, ecolog ecological and climate disaster, what does healing look like when the hurt and the harm is ongoing? H how do we heal under those conditions? I'll offer what I can that comes from my life, from organizing, from working with people, but it also comes from listening to people that have been in circumstances. You know, one of the things that I have to keep understanding and keep situating myself in is like there are people who are experiencing um, things that I have not, and I have not had to learn at this point in time under those conditions. And so, and I have to say, like, when you write a book, you write it, and then a year and a half later or a year later, then people see it. And you're like, oh, I would have written a book in a different way <laughs> today. I, I would have, maybe. Um, but at the same time, a lot of these conditions have are amplifying, ongoing, even what we see in Congo, Sudan, Gaza. We see an intensification of something that has been long long-standing. Um, so I think what I want to first say in that is that a point I just made about perceiving our own conditions and options and choices is important because we are all located in different places in a way. So how can I actually perceive my choices and my power, my reach and my responsibility my relationships, who I can build power with, how can I perceive that from where I am is really important for us to understand where we are situated. I think the other thing in this, um, this question of how we heal, I think relates to the work that I've heard from you too around grief is this it's really convenient that we think about healing as a really individual thing. I'm gonna do it on my own. I'm, I was talking to Kasha today and she was talking about like, you know, the, the weight of everything comes into our bodies. We experience it in our individual bodies. And then we're like, oh, somehow I have to heal this collective pain in my individual body. I have to heal generations of trauma right here. And there is some aspect that we, that we do right here. And there is always a collective aspect to it that has to be addressed. And I, I think when we talk about collective healing, a lot of times it's that we're, we're naming that something has been taken from us in a sense that what is human about experiencing pain, experiencing trauma, experiencing loss, what we might ritualize and do collectively to move through those things are gone. And at the same time, the increase in the reach and the magnitude of the kind of violence that is possible is, is it's incomprehensible to me, actually. So I don't actually know that I have the answer. I don't think it's appropriate for me to answer that question. But I will say I look to um, what we have done over time, which is human technologies for processing trauma for processing pain, for moving through transition. We've always created rituals that respond to the human and the human body and the human process of dealing with pain. Now, I don't know what we have to create in this moment to address what we are witnessing and what people are experiencing, but I think we have to be trying in a way. 
And the reason I asked you the question, I'm glad you answered it that way, because the reason I asked you the question was because I was thinking about it. You know, I was thinking about this earlier. And the answer that I came up with was that we need to grieve. That that's how we actually move while still experiencing the ongoing threat, you know? Um, That grief is its own healing, you know? It's a process of healing. We think about grief in a different way. We think about it as a set of emotions. Yeah. But... But as I read the book, I just felt so much correlation, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I want to tell you, can I, can I tell them about how... I don't know what you're about to say. You're about to yeah. talk, talk about how when, uh, when my, my wife was very ill, yes. you know, and we, uh, she had a, I don't know, it was like a type of stroke or something in, it was in Maui. And I reached out, I just put it on Facebook because I didn't have nobody to turn to. You know, we were just there by ourselves. And they was going to send us to Oahu, to the hospital. They was going to fly us over there. And I said, anybody know anybody (laughs) in Oahu? And it was Prentice and Kasha came to the hospital. Yeah, and was with us every day. And um, I'll never forget that. You know, Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that. And part of what I learned through that process um, was this question of, how we heal together. Yeah. You know, and how, what it, the courage it takes, yeah. the trust that it is required. Yeah. You know what I mean? To mm-hmm. even think that somebody could show up. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he was feeling that. They was feeling that statement. You know what I mean? The, 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 the powers that be hold it. Drop it like I said. There. That was a spiritual power. <laughs> So I'm happy. <laughs> but what it, what occurred to me is just like to to be vulnerable, right, in that way, to try and ask for help, to be connected, and to just when well, you don't you don't know nothing, you don't you ain't got no recourse, no nothing, to even think somebody will show up for you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I just want to ask you. Can and, I tell you a story about that? Yeah, though, please, briefly please. about that moment. Yeah, no. Is that I hope this is okay. Yeah, it is. But. Um, when a, when Alana woke up, I was the only one in the room, actually. Yeah. And I said, hi, I met you. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Lou. I was sitting there, she woke up, I was like, hi. We met once before, you may not remember me, I'm an apprentice. And I think I said something about, like, uh, I don't even, this is going to reveal what a nerd I am, but something about like uh, being friends. <laughs> I was like, it's like something about like us being friends. Can we be friend, friends or something? <laughs> and she was like, I was just being awkward. And she was like, well, we're going to, this is, let's start now. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's something about like, I was feeling so awkward and she was like, oh, let's just begin now. This is where I'm so, <laughs> how did you get it? Where do you stay? You know, we just started entered into conversation in that moment, but it was like getting over that moment of like, can we be connected? Can we actually be authentic? Can we be real in these circumstances? And she was like, well, all right, let's go. Let's get started now on this. That was really powerful. And doing that without the use of her left side, you know, doing that, unable to to move or walk or or any of those things. And the thing, the reason that I think is so beautiful and so powerful is because you then talk about courage in the book, you know? And it just made me think about, you know, the, the depths that we sometimes have to dig to find the courage to face whatever it is we need to face. And I just wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about about courage, because it feels like we need some courage right now, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of the really interesting things about courage that um, I feel like our team has been exploring, and there's some folks, Jennifer and Oscar, here and Alex is not here, but um, we have all, Kasha, been in conversation about courage and um, in some ways there's a surrender in courage that doesn't get named so much has been really curious for me um, 
a surrender to what is larger, a surrender to how it might change us. And knowing that somehow helps me understand how to move into courage. It, I, I will not be... Um, unscathed is not the right word, but courage is actually part of the process of becoming who I am. Is through courageous moments and through reaching for courage, it's, it's, it's actually me becoming me and who I want to be, who I'm longing to be, who I'm ready to transform into. So, um, and courage is, is the quality, action, impulse, it, it underlies everything that is transformative. So when we are doing that work, there's something, some sort of surrender and commitment, some sort of risk and longing that we're allowing to move through us so that we can look at that thing and look at it in a way that goes, tell me, tell me what is here. Or I believe in something, I wanna to move towards something enough that I will risk. And I will risk and be afraid and I will risk because something larger compels me, a vision compels me, the relationships compel me, I'm compelled by something much larger. And I think that's the, there's a power. And I think one of the things that, that I say in the book that has been kind of like a, revelation for me in part was I think about and I've been taught you know trauma breaks apart safety belonging and dignity and how important that is to understand that and I was thinking about courage actually in a way risks those things for the sake of something larger risks my safety for the sake of something larger so when we talk about agency it's through courage that we um, regain elements of our agency that have been lost through violation, pain, whatever it might be. So, but it's risking that. I will risk belonging for the sake of this thing. I will risk safety for the sake of this thing. And I think that's incredibly powerful. I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful and terrifying, you know, yeah. to risk for the sake of community, to risk for the sake of freedom, to risk for the sake of love, you That's know? Right. It's terrifying. Absolutely. But one of the things that I thought was so beautiful was the fact that, um, you know, a lot of times we talk about courage, we talk about it from a very patriarchal yeah. view, you know? Yeah. It's like courage is like we courage to beat people up and you know we you know what I mean like you know but that's not funny also <laughs> I was not expecting that is, is that's how we talk about it though. yeah like courage yeah. in war or courage exactly. and, you know to commit violence to hurt someone there, to hurt yeah. someone yeah. but this way of talking about it it, it feels like a, a feminist uh yeah perspective and a, and a framework the courage to soften that's right know? Yeah. The courage to surrender, the courage yeah. to risk, to trust. Yeah. This is a whole different yeah. ball game. That's and right. it, honestly, it takes much more work yeah. than beat people up. I, yeah. I'll go attest. It's much harder <laughs> <laughs> to soften. <laughs> right. The courage. I was in, in the um, uh, Black Embodiment Mission in our Black spaces of, of practice. There was someone was talking about, I feel like I'm taking risks all the time actually as a black person there's so much risk that I live with and we were talking about the courage to fall into the arms of the people that we were practicing with but that feels like a leap for us you know so many of us are living on certain edges and feel like we have to live on these edges and it does feel incredibly courageous to fall into someone else's arms or to soften or to open or to reveal um, there's courage in that there's courage in that and I felt that when I see these, the videos of these brothers in Palestine pulling these children out, caring for these children, and just there's a softness, you know, inside of it that is just, it's just stunning and uh, painful and a reminder that we can, that under any condition, under every condition, we have choices that we make, you know. So um, I want to remind everybody to write down your questions. Who who got a, uh, what's this called again? Uh, index card. card. Index card. Y'all got index cards? Y'all got questions? Then write your questions down. Y'all need an index card to write your questions down. What happened? 
Who need an index card? Raise your hand if you need an Let index card. Know. Let somebody know. Let somebody come get give we you got an a index card. Up here. We got some up here in the front. I know y'all got questions. Come on, raise your hand up if you need an index card. Somebody gonna bring it to you. I know. Come on, let, use the muscles, the arm muscles. And these are gonna be good. Questions I know you're right strong. They're gonna be good questions. These are gonna be good questions. I'm nervous. Uh -oh, I know. I'm scared too. I'm scared too. Come on. Anybody else need an index card? Then we go. Sis, right here. Okay, we got two right there. Mm -hmm. I hope you bought a pen because you know y'all don't be carrying pens no more. Uh -huh. you like, okay, Patrick got a pen. Anybody need a pen? Patrick got one. All right, excellent. Okay, we ain't gonna get to all these questions, honestly. I'm like, you know, <laughs> we gonna try. I'm gonna try to group them up. I'm gonna try to group okay, them up. Okay, great. Okay, so let's let's move on to like a last situation while they write down the questions, so we can get their questions in. So, um, now I don't ask some very serious questions because it's a serious book, but also I know that you like to get down on the dance floor as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord I, this speaker is like stay away from me. yes I do. yes I do you do okay what are some of the things that inspire you that give you courage that allow you to do the kind of work that you're doing that lift you up you know because I know some of this sometimes we think about healing as this extremely constantly painful yeah. pursuit yeah you know and I don't want to be in pain all the time all the time I don't you know, so what are some other, what, how can we think about it in a way that's that's not simply, you know, a, a string of painful realizations and moments and courage <laughs> and confrontation and da da da. What else? How, what else do we do? You know, what else can we do? Uh, love is some of it. Yes. And I talk about love and you're in the love chapter. I talk about love and I was nervous to talk about love. And I was like, People are gonna think I'm for real. I'm talking about I'm soft. I'm talking about love. But I am soft, so I have to talk about it. Um, love does that for me. And I think in love, am I doing something wrong with this? You're, you're doing something right. I appreciate y'all because I don't know. I don't be talking in these. Thank you. Um, love is part of what moves me and I think being loved enough to change and grow to get to know myself to get to know others to watch change and growth you know I have a child so loving another person into these stages of development is incredible and I think in that is I mentioned earlier wonder and awe to me um, wonder and awe almost uh, there's a correlation between wonder and awe to me and grief in a way. There's a, the humility, the like um, witnessing the magnitude of all aliveness and um, your smallness in that too. The limits to your control um, in a way, I I don't love it, but I do. You know, it's like loving my life in that way, loving life in that way, being awed by life, I, that moves me. Um, and I feel a lot of grief, I feel a lot of pain, and I feel a lot of joy. I do feel it all is in there because I... Uh, I'm trying to encounter what I actually feel. And I do actually feel joy at times. I do actually feel devastating grief at times. And I do feel all those things. But, you know, I dance, I laugh, I be silly, I'm goofy. I be telling, especially now, corny, corny ass dad jokes. <laughs> and my kid be, <laughs> I'm like, I'm the funniest person ever. <laughs> I didn't know. Tonight, I was doing something, and she just was laughing. I was like, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, that brings me joy. I, I think there is so much devastation to witness, and there is so much awe. And in a way, we get convinced away from the awe. Like, we... Um, numb to it. We... 
dampen our own looking and witnessing. And we get confined to this way of being in the world that is that can be languaged and boxed and purchased. But I get so excited when I realize that there is so much beyond what is able to be sold to me. And in fact, that the, the inarticulable, the ineffable, it can never be bought in that way. And that always amazes me and strengthens me and lifts me in those moments and to pay attention to those, to that, which is almost unnameable um, and indescribable and illegible to, to these systems. Um, it's just so, it's an important way for me to move through the world, to, to be witness to those moments. When I look out at the ocean and I see the vastness, you know, when I look up at the sky and I see all the stars, you know, or the children, you know, and they just so fearless and doing shit I would never do, you know, I'm like, don't jump off that, you know, like, it's just, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. And um, as somebody who uh, shut myself down for a long time, you know, um, and through the power of, of love and relationship, you know, and community, was able to be reborn in that space for for me and for all of us who have been reborn in 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 through love and through community and through organizing. I just want to say thank you for this book. Thank you for this beautiful, beautiful book. Do me a favor, turn to your neighbor and say you have the right to heal. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Mm. That's right. <laughs> healing and feeling, that's what we're talking about. So we got some questions up in here. Can, can we get to that? Let's do it. Y'all feel good about it? Okay. We got it. Okay. Now, I'm going to do my best to read what this say. Oh. Mm. Oh. <laughs> 50. Right. We are of a certain age at this point. Through path and practice. How has your capacity to love deepened? Ooh. What does it mean to you now? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, I wrote about it in the book. Um, read the book. Read the book. <laughs> That's the answer. Um, I didn't actually think I did love for a long time. When I was younger, I was like, I don't really do that. That's not something I do. I don't really feel connected to whatever that is that people are talking about. I feel obligation and guilt. That's how I felt in my family. I was like, is this love? I feel like, <laughs> you know. Um, but it was really through somatic work, through embodiment work, that I confronted my longing for love, both to be able to express it in a way that was feelable and to receive it without hiding or sabotaging everything. <laughs> um, and it took a lot of work. It took a lot of work of um, understanding what those blocks were, what those stories were, um, how I was embodying a sense of undeserving of love and um, a commitment to a kind of lovelessness, you know, Bell Hooks talks about, and that shit softened me, it opened me, it changed me, it caused me to grieve things that I had been avoiding grieving. And um, it changed everything in my life. I was able to meet love and the existence of love um, as myself, you know, um, to to allow love me. You know, <laughs> um, back in the day, actually in Oakland, when I used to 
not be married. I would, um, <laughs> that's a long time, ago. long time ago, but I would date like, and I would, um, you know, you try to put your best foot forward and keep that up for like a month and a half. <laughs> And then you're like, at some point, they're going to see me come out. I'm a gremlin, actually. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a heavy foot. <laughs> yeah. <My> best foot. <laughs> but all of that is like, am I, am I deserving of love? So I'm going to pretend that I'm, this is a person that would be deserving of love. And then at some point, I was like, okay, maybe this person can love me as a gremlin <laughs> and see something lovable <laughs> there. Love gremlins. Right. And that's all you gotta do is find somebody that loves your gremlin and then suddenly you start transforming. And then I won't even get into what loving a child has been like, because <sighs> they really put, who said to say it? Oh man. That is a very vulnerable love. There's so, it is very raw and edgy for me, that kind of love. Loving young people who you're caring for and nurturing. Um, I can't, you know, you hear people say this all the time, I can't watch certain things anymore. I just can't do it. I can't do it. I mean, I do do it, but when I do it, I'm, it, it doesn't, there's no blocks anymore. It just pours out of me. So um, it's a devastatingly beautiful, vulnerable love that doesn't allow you to forget the vulnerability, the precarity of life. Come on. Ain't they beautiful? The tough thing that I don't know how to use a mic though, but thank you. <laughs> so here we go. Can you give us transformational characters some words to help us confront a toxic family system? in which all the other members have not yet woken up to their harmful roles. <laughs> Fix it. Fix it. It's scary and I fear having to walk away from my family for some time. Thank you for this question. It's real. Ooh, yeah, that's a real one. Um, oh, it's a real one too because I've been going through something similar personally. Um, And, you know, obviously I can't answer this for you. I don't know your circumstances, resources, any of that. But I will say um, sometimes we be holding on. And sometimes our holding on is a part of the whole dynamic. <laughs> How we hold on, um, who we are in the whole, you know, it's like we also in a way are keeping together the dynamic. And I will say I was telling somebody like this book, writing this book was disruptive to my family system. But I was like, I have to talk about a couple things. Um, it was disorganizing to my family system. And that was really scary for me. But it also changed the whole thing and surprised me. It broke some things, and in some places, I was like, oh, you support me? That's a surprise. I didn't know. But it, you know, I think there's a fear that I had in disorganizing the thing um, that kept me from actually being myself and loving the way that I love, loving without needing to live in secrets or live in guilt and disorganize everything. And I wasn't always willing to do that. I'm not necessarily advocating for that. I don't know your situation, so don't be like Prentice said that I could. Prentice said. That's how I'm not saying that. You recording that, y'all? You see? Well, the other thing sometimes, you know, is transformational characters. A lot of people identify as transformational characters if they're the people keeping their family together or trying to fix their family. And that's not exactly what we're talking about with transformational characters. Sometimes fixing is avoiding feeling. And we're always trying to fix somebody else and we are unwilling to feel the grief of, I have a need that is not met here and is not going to get met here, potentially. And I don't want to feel that. And so I'm going to see if I can just keep getting you to. And so that's the story I talk about with my dad. My dad was like, I'm not going to change. And I was like, oh, 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 oh. 
okay. So that releases me somewhat from this dance, but here I am left with my pain. And um, sometimes we're avoiding that too. I don't know your situation, but... But this is, you know, some of what you're talking about here is the work of boundaries. Yeah. 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 And that's a whole, you know, Prentice became famous with that one <laughs> quote. Didn't even know, didn't even mean to say it like that. Didn't even mean to, I mean, I meant to say it like that. I, I didn't mean to say, say it. it they in be the, the yeah, in the world, right. Yeah. I was like, it's going to be on my, like, headstone <laughs> when I pass. I'm going to be like, boundaries on the distance. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't it. know. Yeah, I didn't know. Life takes a turn. I didn't know. So, but speaking of boundaries, so this idea that healing can be contingent on accountability, but social change and individual change does require accountability. What's the relationship then between healing and strategy, healing and accountability? How do you how do you see that? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Um, it can't be contingent. Yeah, I think it's... I'm just sneaking more questions in here. Um, I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, Mac, I think that there's... Um, I think it makes me want to reiterate the point around healing as not being a state of perfection or a destination that we can achieve, but an ongoing process. And, you know, we can avoid accountability. We can, other people can. It's avoiding a learning. It's avoiding transformation and a, and a collective learning often that we, the collective could receive this learning if we could receive the accountability. Um, but there are, we do have to absorb the learning as much as we can, even when people are individually unwilling to be um, accountable, we still have to, you know, all conflict, all rupture, all um, even harm in moments are, are uh, in order for, there's a learning to be processed inside of everything that happens. There's a learning to be processed. And a lot of times we're avoiding that because we're avoiding uh, confronting our own self-image or we're confronting, we're avoiding responsibility. We're avoiding all of these things that I think are you know, hold up the collective. You're keeping us from learning the thing that we need to do, <laughs> um, but we're gonna figure it out. So I think ongoingly it's a process. The collective has to remain committed to the process of healing, even though um, processes are often incomplete and perfect. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's- I okay. feel like, you know, you are. I mean, I, I, I think I would, I, I would ask also maybe, um, you know, when you talked earlier about the the, uh, the what what the purpose of healing for movements, why mm -hmm. healing movements, right? Um, not just why heal in general, but also how. Yeah. What where is it useful to? Right. You feel me? I do. I do. Yeah. Um, I'll say this that I think in some ways, you know, healing unlocks capacity. It unlocks the capacity for presence, relationship. And it makes us available for power building. There it is. To me. And I think... Say it again for the people in the back. <laughs> I don't know what I said, but I believe that healing unlocks our capacity to be present. It unlocks our capacity for relationship and connection with each other. Um, and it makes us available for building power that I think we are actually unavailable for um, without engaging in that process. Yeah, because when we don't do the do that work, we end up replicating the systems of Period. domination that we've been trying That's to right. avoid. Yes. Exactly. I should. All right, so can you share your thoughts on the role of forgiveness in the movement, in the collective? Uh, what, what's, what forgiveness? Talk about forgiveness. I always feel like the question of forgiveness is a trap, so I'd be avoiding it. It's a it. trap. Is it a trap? I'm sorry. It's not a trap? It's also not a trap. It's not a trap. Speak on it. <laughs> forgiveness. Can we forgive? Should we forgive? What is the, what and is what the is role? Forgiveness? What, is, what is forgiveness? What is the, its role? What does it mean? Yeah, what does it mean? I didn't write the book on forgiveness. Um, <laughs> I didn't. It's not in the book. <laughs> 
No, because that, this is what's interesting, right? Because sometimes when they talk about forgiveness, I'm talking about the they, the, um, the, the dominant yeah. society. It, it's like they're telling co- co- uh, people who yeah. have been under colonial domination yeah. that we should uh, f- forgive them. Yeah, exactly. You know, for the domination. Exactly. And I don't. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I don't. And I decline. <laughs> I shall not. <laughs> But then there's another way, right, of yeah. thinking about forgiveness that's about us and how we yeah. change inside and soften and figure out da, da, da. But that feels like it's more about forgiving ourselves, no? Uh, yeah. I think of forgiveness has a lot to do with forgiving ourselves. If, if forgiving ourselves for um, the parts that we often abandon mm-hmm. in harm, the parts of ourselves that we leave, um, and, uh, you know, it can be hard over years to be like, dang, I left that part of me for decades. And so forgiveness in part is reclaiming that, rejoining that, and forgiving ourselves fundamentally for doing that. I think that forgiveness, you know, it's like, it doesn't work. I think what you're talking about in your example, Mac, I think when forgiveness requires that power remain the same, come on, that's then I think it doesn't work. But when forgiveness is allowed uh, a transformative principle if from where we are forgiving and the person who is also involved in forgiveness or receiving the forgiveness it moves, changes, um, relinquishes, um, restores, I think then forgiveness is incredibly powerful. It frees up energy. It, it um it shifts power, and I think forgiveness is in, is incredible in that way. I think it is actually. I, I hesitate to talk about it because I think it is so powerful, and I think the ways we've conceptualized it have been so limiting, and I think are often in in dynamics of domination and and rejects the transformative potential of forgiveness and grace and and those capacities that I think are incredible. And forgiveness has has been very kind of lodged in a very Christian, you know, and very religious framework, you yeah. know, yes. and uh, that doesn't actually allow for a transformation of systems of domination. Yeah, it's really it's meant to let you skate and let you slide. And it, well, you know, that's what I think. But the, the the other piece though is that there's other words like compassion. Yeah. Like empathy. And understanding. Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? That let's, wow, I'm curious about those words, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I talk about my dad in the book and the, and, you know, the experience I had of my father growing up. And I try to talk about it in a way, I don't say I forgive you, but I do understand a lot more than I did. I do understand him. And that lends itself to a kind of compassion. And I'm kind of just, reshaping of our relationship um, that has been really important. But that that work and the texture of that work, the complexity of that work, to me, I'm like, let's unearth what that is. And maybe there's some forgiveness in there, but it's mostly understanding. And it's it's a witnessing of dignity. Yeah. Uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like absolutely. that's how I think about forgiveness, right. quote unquote. It's like, let me witness your dignity. That's right. As I witness my own. That's right. And let me recover my agency again. That's right. Let me recover my agency. Yeah. So we be out on time, timekeeper. We got one more question. Okay, let's see here. You said what? Instincts. Yeah. I'm not up here for no reason now. (laughs) So you live on a farm, yes? Or something like something that. Something like that. You live on some type of land in nature. I'm from Brooklyn. I don't yeah. Know. I was talking to Soul Fire Farm folks once, and they said, you know you're on a farm if when there's a bad storm, you run out and cover everything. If you, Do you don't, live like then that? you have a garden. Do you have a garden? <laughs> I have a garden. You have a farm. A garden. I don't say a garden. Yeah, no, I don't, yeah. Okay, so you live on, you have land around you. There's yes. animals out there. Yes. You know what I'm saying? There's yes. things. Okay. <laughs> there are animals, though, straight it's up. There are animals. <laughs> it's like, what is it? It's like some type of horses or cows or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you made that choice. You moved from yeah. Oakland. You moved into that type of space. Yeah, but I'm from Grand Prairie, okay, Texas. Okay, Grand Prairie. So let's, let's be honest about it. Grand yeah, Prairie, I'm from, Texas. I'm from Grand Prairie, Texas. 
Okay. So uh, the question here is, how has healing shaped your relationship with land and spirit? Ooh, and spirit. And I thought that would be a good place for us to, mm -hmm. you know, close on. It's this piece about the role also of land and spirit in healing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, one, it's where I come from in a way. I mean, I come from... And I think we all do, but I've come very recently from rural country kinds of people. Country. Yeah, I'm more like semi-country. Semi-country. Yeah. Um, so land has always played a really important role for me in, again, wonder, awe, curiosity. Um, and, you know, one of the things we talk about through our work at the Embodiment Institute is we, we've been saying lately, like, relationship is the reality. And we are um, taken out of our responsibility in relationship. We don't understand the relationship we have to place. Where, what are the, what's the medicine of the trees outside? What are the names of the trees outside? What, you know, these really indigenous ways of knowing. Um, we don't acknowledge them. And in a way we numb ourselves to existing relationship and therefore existing responsibility. Where does your water come from? There's a lot of this we don't know. And, and we, our lives are dependent on these processes happening. Um, so living closer to, I guess, land in that way keeps me in a kind of curiosity, learning, relationship, understanding of how I come to be, how I am cre created through relationship and what I am responsible to. Um, that's really, really important for me. And I, I feel like my relationship deepens, you know, say like a relationship to land, but like specifically my relationship to this like corner of the pasture, my relationship to this tree amongst this grove of trees, like it starts to deepen the more we are actually in relationship. And I think we were t talking to some folks yesterday Obviously, we're facing incredible ecological crises. I mean, we're in the summer. I don't know what it's like here, but in North Carolina, it feels increasingly hot. I'm from Texas. I don't even want to be there. You know, I grew up in heat, but now I'm like, this heat is different. Um, but how do we get... You know, I think a lot of us are disconnected for a lot of traumatic reasons, historical reasons from land and place. But when we deepen our connection to land, I think... Um, will deepen our kind of commitment to uh, just what is happening and how we adapt. And I, I think a lot of us have a theoretical understanding of that, but actual no relationship with animals or trees or that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's important. And spirit, you know, <clears throat> I've been coming out about having a, a relationship to spirit. Um, Come out the closet. Oh, well, again, hopefully this time will be less traumatic <laughs> for me. Um, <clears throat> but I have to maintain, and I keep saying this, I have to maintain a relationship to the not yet, to the unknown. And I imagine to me that spirit is the way that I talk to the, to the possible. And that's through prayer, it's through meditation. To me, it is a dimension um, that guides me and informs me that I can feel. I can feel it when I write, when I do things. There's a alignment, a center, and through my center, a connection to the all. Because this is, I mean, we've got a lot of stuff to do, there's work to do, and there's analysis and all that's really important. But do you ever be like, what is actually going on? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, what are we actually doing? Um, I just like to keep that a little bit. You know, the curiosity, the feeling for um, the bigness of all of it. It humbles me. It right sizes me. It makes me feel creative. It makes me feel um, finite, human, vulnerable, beautiful, miraculous. And somehow, <laughs> somehow that that feeling, that awe, 
that that connection to um, the greater, whatever that is, however you think about that. We need that, actually. We need that in order to do the work that we're trying to do. We think that, you know, I'm a, I'm a my, my family is a Marxist, you know? I grew up, religion is the opiate, you know? And I still believe that. But that's not the same thing as what you're talking about. You feel me? You know, when I thought I lost everything, my wife died and, you know, everybody died and death, 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 death. And I started to uh, walk. And I, and I came up with this philosophy I learned about uh, Salvatore Ambulando. It is done by walking. And I just took one step and then I took another step and I went out in nature and I found delight in the smallest things in the flowers, in the trees, in the sky, the little animals. I did not find any delight in roaches, and I never will. <laughs> I never will, I never will. But I found delight in all the other animals, <laughs> you know. But this, this, this connection, you know, we can't do this work without it. We think we can, but we can't. We can't, you know, because you can't sustain. And what my, my mom said, that that's also the love of the people, is that too? Is that too? So we gonna end here with this feeling of awe, with this courage, with this commitment that you've shown through the writing of this book. It takes a lot of vulnerability to write a book. You don't know how people are gonna receive it. Are they gonna hate it? They gonna love it? You know, is it even going to be relevant by the time it's published? It takes a lot of courage to risk and expose and show yourself in that way. And we love you for that. And we thank you for that. Thank you. Just thank you all so much. I really receive that, and I also witness that we are creating this together. That it's a, it's a piece of whatever you feel here. We've created and generated, and we can take back to wherever we go. This is us, and I'm I'm so grateful and so grateful also to Malkia who has been. such a teacher in courage, in um, clarity, precision, in um, power. And you've made a, a, such an impact on my life for a long time now in so many ways. I think, you know, you're, you grow, you transform, you change, and in that become, your impact becomes even more deeply felt. And I can feel it in this room and the way that people um, engage and witness you. So I just have so much gratitude to you personally. Thank you for doing this. You know, you, you, we don't get paid to, you know what I mean? Mac did this, just, just because. So yeah, I appreciate that. So much gratitude to all of us doing this. So thank you. And thank you to the team. I think we're done. So y'all can go home now if you want to. Um, I'm going to be hanging out back there signing books at the blue table. Um, yeah, but thank you all. We really appreciate it. Get into the blue table. What a pleasure. And see you on the block. Thank you.